this morning we're going to start right off with the hymn instead of the doxology. So it's number 421. I will sing the wondrous story. Do you have a hymn now? That's my hope. 
At least I work to I work to try to be. And as always, I ask for prayer that uh, you guys pray for me, and that I always have the words that the Lord wants me to say. I always have the my ear open to the Holy Spirit. Uh, because I am fleshly and I am weak and I don't do that all the time and neither do you and that's okay for the most part but we need to absolutely try to do better that's the deal that's a, and we all get tired I get it I get it but sometimes you just have to bear up and get to it with the Holy Spirit and not let the world uh, look so dangerous and nasty because there really, a lot of it is not, actually. You can be depressed all you want. Um, that's up to you. I choose not to be. I choose to feel blessed and to be strengthened by that and uh, not let the buggers wear you down. Um, we're not supposed to look like a people who are scared to death every other three seconds, but unfortunately that's the way we look a lot. And I get kind of sick and tired of it. Um, because we have what we have. The Lord has blessed us. We who believe on him have amazing abilities. And we don't act like it. <laughs> right? This is not to say we should walk around thinking we're well, right all, all the time. Because we're absolutely not. And generally we're more wrong than other people are. But... We can get things right, we can be smart, we can be discerning, we can be salt. But in order to be salt, you gotta be strong salt. Right? What is it? If Jesus said if salt loses its flavor, what do you got? No. Talcum powder, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a chemist. <laughs> Sodium, <laughs> right? Unsalty that is useless, yes. in other words. Tasteless. Bitter. Right? We throw away light bulbs that don't work, right? Right. Why shouldn't God? We're here to be light, right? Yeah. Well, if we don't work, what's God going to do? Put us in the bin because he can't use us. Right? We're not to be dark and we're not to be unsalty. <laughs> it's just stuff to try to remember as the day, the world can wear you down. I get it. Don't let it. We have victory. We have forgiveness. We have amazing grace. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Who, by the way, was responsible for raising a certain young man from the dead. Huh? Okay? That's who we have. Let's remember that. Okay, so we dive into this bad news. Jesus is with the disciples. He's telling them a number of things. <clears throat> talking about what he's going to have to go through. He's talking about things that to be aware of. He was saying there was going to be a Messiah every other day show up saying, I am the Christ. And fooling a lot of people into thinking that they work. And Jesus was telling them, you know, don't pay attention to these people. Um, unfortunately, humankind does pay attention to these people. And some of them buy that. Jesus said, you know, person, people are going to come around saying, I am the Christ, and they're going to deceive many. Jesus said that. So it's really kind of useless and foolish to be upset that there's all these fake Christs walking around, <laughs> right? Or every other election, it seems somebody is pointing at somebody as being the Antichrist, and I'm thinking, oh, man, you guys don't know your scripture at all. At all. What is Antichrist? Well, it's Christ's enemy. No, no, it's not. It's the other Christ that people build up to be this wonderful person. When the Antichrist finally does show up, 
They're going to think that he's the greatest guy ever. Because he's going to feed a lot of people, he's going to do a lot of really, really good things, and then he's going to turn the tables. But he's going to goof up everybody. And no, he doesn't look like the cartoon Satan. Right? Red skin, demon, demonic looking. No, that's not going to be what he looks like at all. Read the book. <laughs> okay? Get with his program. No? Anybody else's. So yeah, people are going to fool people. There's deceivers. There were con men walking around the streets of Jerusalem right in front of Jesus. He sat down and ate with a bunch of them. Huh? Remember that? There was a guy that used to cheat on people's taxes. Huh? And he he used to people would go pay taxes and he'd cheat and he'd pocket a little money. You know what that is? He wrote a he wrote a book in the libraries, the first book of the New Testament. New Testament? Yeah. Matthew. <laughs> he was a thief. He was a con man. He was like playing three card Monty on the avenue, right? The three cards, and you flip over, and you guess where the peanut is, and you know, oh, it's not there. Or guess where the queen is? That's kind of stuff that he used to do. Jesus can use amazing people. <laughs> so yeah, Jesus knows. Jesus knew these people, and he still loved them, still went to the cross for them. So, and there again, too, like when the Apostle Paul says, do not judge, do not. Because you don't know the story. You think you do, but you don't. Many of you shall come in my name. I am Christ, and they'll deceive many. So then Jesus is talking about wars and rumors of wars and all the bad stuff that normally goes on. Right? That is bad news, but nothing you really need to be upset over much about other than it's too bad that that happens. All right? But then he goes and he gets into specifics. People are looking for a sign. Let me ask a question about signs, all right? My understanding is that if you have a prophecy, you generally have signs around that prophecy, right? See, this is what the disciples were asking Jesus about. He was starting to prophecy, and they were asking for signs. And Jesus said, you're, you ain't going to get any. <laughs> there won't be one. Okay. The Christmas story. The angels showed up, right, with the shepherds. What did they tell the shepherds? About a sign. The sign would be the baby in the manger, wrapped in the swaddling clothes. And this shall be a sign unto you. Did the baby's birth already happen? Yes. Yes. So there goes a lot of people's ideas about sign of things are going to be coming soon. The sign that pointed to Christ already happened. What are some of the other famous signs? Well, when Jesus says, you know, this is a great look at temple, but it's not going to be around for a long <laughs> it's not going to, there won't be one stone left standing on top of another one. Is that a sign? No. But when you see the temple torn apart and torn down, well, you can figure that's a sign, but the, it already happened. Okay? We were talking about, well, Jesus in chapter 13, verse 11. He's talking about when the bad times are going to come and they will lead you and deliver you up. Take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given to you in that hour, that you say. 
For it is not you that says, but the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit gives you the words to say when these things happen. So when these things start happening that Jesus is talking about, what are we supposed to do? This is an out of time thing. Now, Jesus was referencing himself here too. Because this was going to happen within a few days, or about a week or so, that Jesus was taking, talking about this and it was going to happen to him, right? He was going to be brought before the courts, kings, right? The rulers. And he was going to be tried illegally as it so happens, but. And what did he say? Don't try to plan ahead of time. Don't try to plan ahead of time. Don't worry about what you're going to say. What did he say about it? He said to say to the governors or whoever it is what the Holy Spirit's given you to say. Yeah, say what the Holy Spirit says to say. But he's not really just talking about speaking either. He's using speaking as an example. For instance, Take no thought beforehand what you shall say in your defense or whatever. Take no thought, therefore, what you're going to do. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to do. He's not just talking about speech. All right? This is Jesus Christ talking. It's both and. There's more to it than just the one aspect of what he wants his disciples to do with regard to how the Holy Spirit fills them and causes them to act. Okay? That's important to understand the rest of the stuff. So being aware of our thinking, because our first thought might be, oh no, oh no, and then to just pull back from that and say, wait, wait, nope, Jesus told us the Holy Spirit is with us not to worry that we are to trust in him. When this stuff starts to happen, do not freak out. <laughs> I told you it was going to happen. I told you for sure it was going to happen. When it starts happening, don't act like a moron. Don't freak out. Act like a believer in me. Huh? What do you think? Want to give that a shot? Because so far, his disciples, man, they're really not with it. They're not getting the picture. Verse 12, now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. Where did we see that happen already? There's been a bunch of places where it's happened. Nazi Germany being one of them. China. The Civil War being another. Here in the United States. In Ireland it's happened. It's happened all over the world. This is nothing new. We have trailer parks all across America full of this kind of garbage. All right? So this is not specific prophecy to the disciples. It is just another thing that Jesus says, this is how bad it can get. Be ready for it. Be aware of it. Don't let it throw you off what I'm telling you to do. Right? Don't let it sway you from obeying my two commandments. Don't be worried about putting Ten Commandment tablets in your courthouses. That's dumb. You're not paying attention to my first two. What are you doing that nonsense for? <clears throat> brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And... You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. 
well, nobody's ever treated me badly because I'm a Christian. Oh, wait. No, a couple of people actually have. And it was hard for me to love them in spite of them doing that. Jesus, I'm just saying, <laughs> your second commandment, tough, tough job. Especially when they hate you because you are a Christian. And you're going to have that, and we have had that. This is nothing new and nothing we, but we should be aware of it, and we should know what to do with how the Holy Spirit has taught us what to do with it before, and what Jesus taught us what to do with it. Love your enemies. <clears throat> oh, we hate that. We don't want to do that at all. That's dumb. Why would you do that, Jesus? And I would think, if he was here, you know, alive, and you could hear him speak, he'd say, somebody has to. There's a reason why these people are like they are. Maybe we'll be the one that can change them. Maybe my work through you will be the answer to somebody's changing their life. For me, Jesus says. We don't go there. We just don't. We're too busy with our own garbage. We like sorting through our own garbage. Right? We do. We enjoy it, whether we realize it or not. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure to the end, the same self shall be saved. He that endures, who is that? Well, hopefully it's you and me. She that endures. Endures how? Stays alive? Not necessarily. Stays true to, do Stays what true to what he has said. Yeah. Yes. You that stay true to what he has said. You who fight to do and follow the second commandment, you will be saved. Now you can say, well, I've already been saved. Guess what? That's a phrase. Are you born again? That's a phrase. Saved. What does that mean to you? I used to hate it when some of the elder ladies during the VBS, how many children were saved? I said, I have no clue. I, used, I hated when they would ask that. How many children were saved? From what? Uh, <laughs> it really drove me nuts. I don't know. All I know is we work very hard to present Jesus Christ and his gospel to a bunch of kids. That's what I know for sure. And is that not worthy enough? Do we have to have a scoreboard? No. No! In fact, we should do away with the scoreboards. It's got nothing to do with what you're supposed to do. He saves, we don't. But we are supposed to be enduring and acting the way he wants us to act. He says, you do that through no matter what's coming, you're going to be saved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be empowered by the Spirit. Your mind is going to change, your heart will change, your body will change, and you'll change others. No, you may not live through it, but that's not the same thing. Whose hands are we in? His. His. 
Kathy and I were in the car, turned the car on. What comes on the radio? But Seals and Crofts, Diamond Girl. And I'm thinking, when I bought that 8-track and I listened to it with my headphones the first time back in the 70s, little did I know that there was a bomb going off in my building to go off in my closet, which would blow the door off and shoot a big, big ball of flame through my bedroom. Except that I heard my sister's voice calling me downstairs to supper. So I turned the stereo on, took the A-track out, right, and wasn't listening to Diamond Girl, and I went downstairs. And that's when the fire happened when we lived down here. But that's what happened. That's how it started. In my closet, in my bedroom. And it blew out into the bedroom five minutes after I got up and left. <laughs> That's whose hands I'm in. No doubt about that. Our kids, our kids, his kids that he's letting us borrow, they're in his hands. Our friends, ones we love, they're in his hands, not ours. We can work to help and save them, but it's his, they're his. Huh? I said, we don't do the saving, you know, no. we can, and people can say, yes, I believe, but it's what's in their own heart that is the truth. And so people can say whatever they want to say, but whatever's really there is what matters. Okay, verse 14, here we go. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let him that reads understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days and pray you that your flight be not in the winter, for in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Oh boy, got a lot of unpacking to do here. When are those days? Excuse me. Verse 19 to me seems to indicate that it hasn't happened yet. Because it says that such a time has not occurred since the beginning of creation and which God created until now and never will. Mm -hmm. Okay, remember this is Jesus speaking, so we've got to deal with the both and part of it, right? Who is he talking to? Who is Jesus talking to? His disciples. Right. If he's talking to them about something that is not going to happen during their lifetimes, why is he even bothering? So it gets written down in their book? I don't know. <laughs> right? They came to him talking about how great the temple was, and he goes into this long... <laughs> this whole long thing, yeah. Oh, geez, don't, don't be asking the teacher a question. We'll be here forever. <laughs> yeah. It seems to me this sort of thing has happened over and over and over again, just like we said, people being persecuted for their belief in Christ. Um, people who have fled um, communist China or who have fled Nazi Germany or who have fled um, other oppressive places where there was an abomination. All of, all of their ability to um, worship in the way that they would as Christians was being destroyed and they were going to be killed and they had to leave in just this kind of manner. So we know of people 
throughout history who have actually had to leave in these sorts of situations and yes even in winter and some didn't survive you know so we this kind of thing it sounds like i have read about this a lot in a lot of different countries and a lot of different circumstances maybe even in this country as well in places you know so is it really um sometime that's going to happen that we don't know about yet i don't know i don't think that it necessarily is it seems like this has happened and i think continues there's, to happen. i think there is one in particular thing that he's prophesying that may not have happened yet although it could have um, but the other part of what he's saying is this is still part of what happens all the time but when you see verse 14 the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet who knows what daniel the prophet said about the abomination of desolation if you'd like to turn to daniel <clears throat> excuse me 11.31, Daniel 11.31. And I'd like somebody to read that one. Anybody got it? Got it. Do you want me to read it? Betty, would you please read that loudly, if you could? His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. <clears throat> then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Yeah. King James has it. Arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. Well, there's your answer right there. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Good answer, huh? <clears throat> They're also referencing Daniel 19. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Personally, I have no idea why, because here's what 9.27 says. All right? And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Ooh. It seems to me that if you look at chapter 9, verse 27, what causes the desolation is the fact that they stop giving sacrifice in temple. Does that make sense? He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Ooh. They're not going to be doing church, in other words. <laughs> okay, you know what I mean? They're not going to be going through what they're supposed to. It sounds like there's almost two parts to it. Like Precisely, yes. Yeah. They stop one thing and replace it with a bad thing. Yeah. And there's some, there's, David and I were discussing it earlier, during the Maccabean, or before, uh, the, in, in the intertestamental times, 
we had this thing where something really bad happened somebody they were mocking they were mocking the temple sacrifice sacrifices who was the Greeks yeah yeah the Greeks were mocking they were coming into the temple and they were setting them dressing up in a priest and they were making fun of the way the Hebrews the Jews worshiped they were making fun of them Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, uh, I think that's how you say it. Yeah. He was one of the Roman governors, so I think. It's in that. Yeah, the Greco Roman, in between times, between Greece and Rome, in between the times that they, one or the other, ruled Jerusalem or ruled Israel at that time, and there was a time frame where. They kind of both did, and <laughs> so this was a transition time. Not just intertestamental inter times, but you had, you had governing bodies that were switching around. And a lot of people weren't very nice to the Jews at that point in time at all. And it was really horrible. And they had this desolation happen in the intertestamental inter times. I wish I could say that correctly. <laughs> and somebody actually put a peg on the altar. Well, <laughs> just the barest understanding of Mosaic law tells you you weren't supposed to eat unclean animals. You're not supposed to sacrifice unclean animals. So don't be pouring buckets of shrimp all over the altar and sacrificing a pig. What are you supposed to sacrifice? Well, a clean animal for one thing. But these people were just absolutely making fun of it. And of course, nothing like that has ever happened again. <clears throat> Wrong. Good old 70 AD. What did we have? Uh, the destruction of the temple. Destruction of the temple. What happened before that? It says in AD 40 there was Emperor Caligula who tried to desecrate the temple. Caligula was an insane pig. He really was. He was nuts. He was absolutely nuts. And he probably read about that thing during the Maccabean period and laughed and said, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. That's how crazy he was. But what had stopped before that particular abomination? They stopped having church. They stopped the sacrifices. They stopped doing the services. They had to. You couldn't go in anymore. And then eventually, within about two months, the place got torn down because it was pretty much useless. It was just a party joint. Somebody took over that temple and turned it into a real rave place. And certain, certain people who were still devout would still try to go there, and it was that is a desolation for sure. And that's an abomination for sure. It's cruel and horrid and horrific. But for a period of 30 years, this stuff was going on. And on again, off again, on again, off again. Okay to worship in temple now this week, but next week, no, nope, can't do it. Nah, maybe two weeks after. Then maybe you could, depending on who's in charge that week. <laughs> this is how this stuff happens. Right? Has anybody ever seen, it's a French film that takes place during World War II, and allegedly it's based on a true story. The Nazis take out Paris, they take out France, right? They are ruling France in World War II, right? Except for one little town, one little village that has been evacuated, that had what they used to call insane asylums, right? On the top of a hill. And the, in, the, the patients of the insane asylum break out of the insane asylum, come down and find the entire little village abandoned. 
and so they become the populace of this little village for a while one of them becomes mayor another one becomes chief of police and they ran this little village for about a year and a half before they were overrun again by and i but i tried to find where if this was a true story where it was based on and i have not found it yet but there's enough there's enough um talking about it there's enough uh information about something like that happening that i can probably still find it when i if i dig down deep enough and research it honestly rather than just occasionally yeah. i would like to find out but you have these insane people being the chief of police and the mayor of this town it's and it was a film a really, really good film too that's essentially what happens here. Between 40 AD and 70 AD in Jesus' Jerusalem and Israel, the inmates have taken over. <laughs> the crazy people have started taking over. You've got Caligula, and look him up. That guy was nuts. Insane, bad, horrific, whatever other word you want to use on it. For him. And his relations were no better. And this is why it stuff got torn down and just, just desolation in certain areas. Making fun of the way they served. It'd be like if somebody came in here with a six pack of bud and some Cheetos and said, hey, I'm gonna give you guys communion. And somebody would think that's really funny. And they do it. Well, that's really disrespectful, I think. Is it an abomination? I suppose some people would think about it, but I've got more important stuff to worry about right now. <laughs> right? Right? If it gets to that point, we got other stuff to worry about. Is it going to happen? Could it happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes people are just utter pigs. You give the wrong people power, and that's what you're going to get. Right? And that has happened over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. It is nothing new. Even this abomination of desolation, nothing new. When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, which apparently points to what's going to happen here at Jesus' time. All right, so that kind of says that when you see this, this is a sign to what Daniel was talking about, not necessarily what I'm talking about. Do you see what's happening? Do you see that? Why would Jesus quote Daniel? unless he was talking about a specific thing that Daniel said. And what is the specific thing that Daniel said? That time will come when, <clears throat> when the temple will be desecrated. Yeah. Yeah. Which by Jesus' time, apparently, by a lot of people's understanding, had already happened. If, like people think, it was the pig on the altar, well, when did that happen? About 150 years before Jesus was born. So the sign <laughs> already happened. Maybe. But if it's both and. It's both and. You have to open your brain. It's not one or the other. It is one and the other. Jesus is telling his disciples, stuff's going to get very, very bad. And 
because Jesus knows, knew then that his words would be written down, recorded eventually. He has a message for us in here too regarding that. One, stop worrying about stuff that's going to happen over and over and over and over again. Stop looking for a sign because you're not going to get one. Instead, do what? What I told you to do, which is what? Be faithful. Without ceasing. Endure. Yeah. He that endures will be saved. Not he that gets upset and goes crazy getting upset will be saved. That's not what he says. He that spends all of his waking hours looking for a sign will be saved. That's not what he said. He that wrings his hands over things that are getting so bad. I, get, I think we're in the end days now. He that walks around saying that will be saved. No. He that endures. He that understands. He that reads. He that hears. Let them have understanding. Where do we get understanding from, folks? The Spirit, His Word, and His Word says, I have these two commandments. All of this other stuff that you worry about is stupid. <laughs> do what I told you to do. Don't get nervous about the end days. You're all going to die. You're all going to feel like the, through the end days. I get it. Stop. If you endure until your last day, you're saved. And you'll be blessed. And you'll go in my Father's president, presence and you'll hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. But if you don't do that, you're not going to hear that, are you? Hey, great job worrying about the end times. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it seems like seems like he, Jesus is talking about the temple and the worship rituals that they have and how this not really what's going on in the heavenly realm mm -hmm. you know where he talked to the woman at the well and he said that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth in spirit and in truth they will worship in spirit and in truth not in fear and not in a specific location being the temple they don't need to, that's what I'm, I'm trying to hit on is that they don't, you know, that they're saying, oh, the temple is so beautiful, it's grand, we have this place to worship. And yeah, this is the specific, this is part of what Jesus is getting at with his disciples at the time. Yes. Both and. Right. We're telling he's telling his disciples, okay, yeah, it's a pretty place, but guess what? And guess why? <laughs> Right? This is going to go away. And it's going to go away badly. And you're worrying about it isn't going to change a thing. However, I want you to be aware of, and he gives you some suggestions here, right? Let him that is in the housetop not go down to the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. Right? Because stuff in the house is going to go bad. Now, what I'm trying to figure out is why would I be on the housetop anyway? Uh, uh, the flat top to get out of the house. Uh -huh. They had flat top houses. Yeah, flat top houses. No, but well, you instead of hanging out on the porch, on the you hang out on the roof. <laughs> how, how tall were the houses generally? <laughs> Could you jump from the roof and run away? No, no, no. Why not? Yeah, 
No, you could, but, but they also had steps. You are. <clears throat> As she was saying, there were also steps that were that went down from there usually. Yeah. The way that the houses were. They're not built like our houses. And you'd be on the roof because sometimes it's hot and you want to go outside because it's cooler. Here's your homework. Look up old houses in Jerusalem at that era. Mm -hmm. And you'll understand this better, right? Let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. Just go. Run! Get out! Because the bad guys are coming. And why aren't you wearing your garment in the field? Because you're working and you're sweating and it's hot. Run. Because it's gonna, there's gonna be people you don't want to meet. <laughs> but I don't have my garment. Well, what has Jesus said about garments? <laughs> he quotes a song about it, right? The Lord knows you have need of these. Stop worrying about stuff. Go and do what I told you. <laughs> you trust me. Or but, 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 I'd love to follow you, Jesus, but I gotta bury my dad and let the dead bury the dead. Huh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't like that, but uh, follow me, he says. Do what I'm telling you. Don't worry about getting your garment. But I've got I've got stuff back at the house. Don't worry about the stuff in the house. Go. Don't go back in the house for the, your stuff. This is going to be bad. Pay attention. Ah, uh, woe to them that are with child, and to them that must nurse those child children. It's going to be bad. That's a woe, right? Woe, W-O-E. Pray that your flight be not a wonder. Pray that at least you have nice weather when you've got to run. That you can do. That's all right. But he's warning. This is going to be soon, guys. And he's telling them. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Now, if we weren't going through, I want to say night, through Bible study, and had we not just gone over Lot <laughs> and Sodom and Gomorrah, and yeah, Gomorrah, Right, Sodom. I'm thinking they've seen stuff like this before, so I don't know if Jesus is just using hyperbole here. I, I think he's saying you think you've seen bad times, but you have no idea. That's a, Yeah, I, I got the impression that he's using hyperbole to make an impression on his dense disciples. <laughs> but to be continued... There is more to this than meets the eye. Still, see, this is the thing about prophecy. Be really careful. Be really, really careful about it. All right? And above everything else, do what Jesus said to do. Not stuff that you know he didn't tell you to do. <laughs> or stuff that he seems to be saying, don't waste your time doing that. Stop it. Do this instead. You're not going to get any bumper sticker stuff out of this stuff from this chapter. Ain't going to happen. Heavenly Father, strengthen us to do your will. Strengthen us to do what your son told us to do. Thank you, Jesus, for the warnings. Holy Spirit, give us the discernment to put those warnings in their proper place in our lives. Amen. All right.
glorious, number 371. somebody's life may be hanging in the balance and we might be the one that you use to save it. Amen. Amen. Love you. Have a great week. Thanks for coming. Come back. <laughs>